Yama everyone and welcome to NAIDOC 2020 hosted by Georgia's River Council. My name is Georgia and I'm a proud Wailwind woman from the Gomeray Nation. I'm a Georgia's River local and I'm very lucky and fortunate enough to live on the beautiful lands of the Bidigal country. I'm a PhD student and a researcher looking at the importance of giving First Nations youth a voice and agency and also looking at how Indigenous youth conceptualise wellbeing. This year's NAIDOC theme, Always Was, Always Will Be, recognises that First Nations people continue to hold a connection and care for country and have for over 65,000 years. As First Nations people, we had our own diverse laws, languages, cultures and kinship systems. Importantly, as First Nations people, we have never ceded our sovereignty. However, First Nations people in Australia today do not have their voice enshrined in the Constitution and are, not, and are the only Indigenous people in the globe that do not have a treaty and voice in Parliament. One movement that recognises and hopes to change this is the Uluru Statement from the Heart. We're very lucky to be joined by Gomeroy and Camilla Roy Mann, Dylan Booth, who is a representative from the New South Wales Uluru Youth Dialogue. Dylan is a manager in EY's Indigenous Sector Practice, a full-purpose practice that is driven by a commitment to empowering First Nations to secure a better future. Dylan is a member of the Uluru Statement from the Heart Youth Dialogue. Dylan is a UNSW graduate and an experienced Big Four professional. Dylan has dedicated his career to advancing the interests of First Nations Australians and does this through advising state and federal government corporates and not-for-profits on how best to achieve transformative outcomes for First Nations people, with a focus on child protection, youth justice and program and policy design and evaluation. Dylan is a strong advocate for Aboriginal self-determination, sovereignty and empowerment, all of which are core tenets of the Uluru Statement from the Heart. Dylan's lived experience as an Aboriginal man, as well as his experience working in the Indigenous sector, allows him to bring a unique uh, understanding of issues. Dylan is committed to exploring more effective ways to address the complex and often intersecting, intersecting challenges that our First Nations communities face. Well, welcome Dylan, uh, and thanks for joining me today to have a yarn about this important social movement. Um, before we commence our yarning discussion, I would like to firstly acknowledge and pay my respects to the Bidigal people of the Eora Nation, who are the traditional custodians of this land, we are standing on today. I would also like to extend my respects to other First Nations people who are present and who are watching this video today. Welcome Dylan. Thanks so much. Uh, I thought it would be a great opportunity firstly for you to share a bit about yourself, who your mob is and what is your role at Ernest & Young. Yeah thanks so much and firstly thanks for the um, such a warm welcome. Uh, my name is Dylan Booth, I'm a very proud Gomorrah Camillaro man. Uh, I spent the majority of my life uh, living here in Sydney on beautiful Gagel and Bidjigal country. Oh, uh, so yeah, it's been great. I've uh, grown up in Maroubra. It's been a, a, That's lot, a lovely a, place there. Fantastic place to grow up. Um, I am a manager in EY's Indigenous Sector Practice. So basically we are a group of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander professionals uh, who work day in, day out on advancing the interests of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people across the country. Uh, awesome. The work that I focus on and, and and most passionate about is uh, child protection, vulnerable families, uh, and and community wellbeing. Um, as you mentioned, I'm a member of uh, the New South Wales Youth Order State from the Heart Dialogue. Um, we are uh, a member, a group of uh, youth who are incredibly passionate about uh, the statement, what it represents, and uh, the opportunities that it presents for uh, our our communities and our people across the country. Yeah, no, that's awesome, and. Um as a representative of the Uluru Statement of Youth Dialogue, um, tell us a bit about you know what the Uluru Statement is and what it represents. Yeah, absolutely, I will. And just before I get into to the crux of the Uluru Statement, there's a there's a few um, frame of comments or opening remarks that that I should lead with. And um, the first is to acknowledge the tireless efforts of uh, the leaders of this campaign, Professor Megan Davis, Arnie Papp, and and so on. Uh, uh, those those fantastic women have been um, carrying the burden, carrying the load of this for. Yeah. for a long time and uh, it would be remiss of me to uh, to not acknowledge their their hard work and their, and, their, always and, the front line. and their dedication and uh, the other thing that I must say is um, if we take a look at Australia's colonial history um, the political activism and political savviness of Aboriginal people is incredibly obvious and, and evident and you know if we look at the you know the 1938 day of mourning the 67 referendum the 10 embassy 
so on and so on. Um, we see a, a, a rich history of, of Ab Aboriginal political activism. Um, the Uluru State from the Heart exists in the continuum of, the, of that political activism. Um, our old people have fought so hard for so long um, for us to have these opportunities to present, to provide us with this platform, and this is the next step on that journey. So really, it's about paying paying our respects to those who have come before us, um, and and paving the way for those who are yet to come for a better future for them. No, definitely, and it's not new. We've been fighting for so long, and this is just an extension to keep keep them fighting for justice. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. So the, the Uluru Statement is, a, is an invitation, it's a gift to the Australian people and what it represents is uh, Aboriginal Australia's uh, ambitions or, or ideal uh, ideas for the, for the future. So it represents uh, a constitutionally enshrined voice to Parliament yeah. uh, and the establishment of a Makarata Commission to oversee a process of agreement making and truth telling. Yeah, and for allow First Nations people to make decisions on their lives absolutely. and have more of a voice. Absolutely, absolutely. And there are, there are a couple of things that underpin the statement. Um, the first of which is um, Aboriginal self-determination. So um, for a long time in Australia, government, um, government have made decisions on behalf of Aboriginal communities or on behalf of Aboriginal people. Uh, and, and Aboriginal people have often been an afterthought in the process or a, a consultation at the end, at the end of the process. Um, the, the time for that is no more. Um, we know that um, our people and our communities uh, are the experts and, and understand their situations better than, than government can. Um, and government have proven, uh, the, the bureaucracy and the policy makers have proven that uh, the capacity to make meaningful change is, yeah. is out, of, out of reach for them. At the end of the day, we understand our needs, Absolutely. what needs to be done, Absol the Absol government. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And um, that core principle of self-determination underpins the, the, the everything and uh, everything that's uh, represented in the Uluru Statement from the heart. The second and, uh, and equally as profound element of the statement is uh, Aboriginal sovereignty or First Nations sovereignty. And essentially, you know, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people made up the first sovereign nations of the continent of Australia and its adjacent islands. Um, that sovereignty was never ceded. It has never been ceded since the arrival of the British and at no point since then has that sovereignty been ceded. Um, we had our own wars. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. We had our own laws, our own way of uh, relating to the land, um, structuring our communities, kinship. Um, kinship, really complex kinship systems. Um, and that's never been ceded. Ab absolutely, absolutely. You know, our culture tells us that um, we've been the custodians and have been walking with country for time immemorial. Uh, modern, modern day science tells us uh, it's at least 60 millennia. So either way you look at it, we've been here for a long time. Um, and for, for, that, for that time, uh, Aboriginal people have been caring for country, uh, have been looking after country, and have been returning to country. And that ancestral and spiritual connection to country is the basis of Aboriginal sovereignty. And that is something that supersedes uh, any legal doctrine, any legal document, or, or any so-called British settlement. Yeah, absolutely, definitely. Um, why is First Nations voice enshrined in the Constitution so fundamentally important? Yeah, absolutely, and it's, it's something that we touched on briefly before, and it's this whole concept that um, First Nations people are uh, the experts, they understand yeah. their situations and, and the solutions to whatever problems they face, and they should be empowered to make those decisions on their own. Yeah. So the Uluru Statement calls for a constitutionally enshrined voice to Parliament, so the significance of that is um, uh, having the voice enshrined in the Constitution is that we're not at the whim of government of the day, so the only way you can amend the Australian Constitution is through a referendum yeah. and the only way you achieve a referendum is through the Australian people. Yeah. So when I say that the Uluru Statement is a gift to the Australian people, it's, it's actually quite a beautiful thing because it's an invitation for us all to walk together yeah. and, and achieve a, a, a much brighter future than, than what we have. No, definitely. Up. And I think, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Indigenous First Nations Australians are the only you know, First Nations in the world that Absolutely. does not have a, yeah. a voice in Parliament Certainly, and a yeah. treaty. Certainly, yeah, we're the, we're the only Commonwealth country that doesn't uh, recognise uh, its First Peoples yeah. uh, appropriately in the, in, in the foundational documents of, of, of our country, which is, yeah. which is quite a shame. Yeah, no, it is. Um, and if we did see a treaty um, established in the near future, what do you think, I mean, you've touched base on it before, what would it mean for First Nations people in this country to have a voice, be able to make decisions? Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, treaty has always been a, a really profound political goal for for our First Nations in Australia, um, not only because of, of how political, politically, 
politically active we've been and politically savvy we are, but for what it represents. So um, the Uluru Statement calls for the establishment of a Makarata Commission to oversee a process of agreement making. So Makarata is a Yolongu word and it stands for, or it represents the process of two parties coming together after a conflict. Um, so if we apply that to, to the treaty or agreement making process, essentially it's about um, Australia, uh, uh, Australia and, and First Nations Australia reconciling the differences of the past. Um, the significance of the Makarata Commission is to speak to uh, the power imbalances that exist across the country. So it's no secret that um, government um, hold the cards. Um, First Nations communities are often subject to government decisions and, and so on and so forth. So um, the Makarata Commission will be established to make sure that each First Nation is appropriately resourced and supported yeah to negotiate with, with the state, with the Crown, in a way that best suits their interests and their aspirations. Yeah, no, definitely. And much of the aim and vision of the Uluru State from the Heart is truth-telling. Um, what, what is truth-telling? Yeah, so, look, I have to admit, truth-telling is uh, uh, the part of this um, reform that means the most to me. Yeah. Um, it, it resonates with me the most, and I'll explain why. So, in, in Australia, I think that we have this tendency to, to glorify the colonisation process. Mm. Um, we, we have the view that colonisation is something to be proud of and something to be celebrated. And, you we know, see that on Australia Day 26th. Cer certainly, January 26th every year is a, is, a, is a prime example of that. And I don't think that the broader Australia, Australian society has much of a, uh, much consideration into what that actually means for our First Nations. So what I mean by that is the, the arrival of the British some 200 years ago really for our, for our communities represents dispossession from country, uh, disconnection from culture, uh, our families were torn apart and our kids were taken, uh, there was uh, genocide, um, famine, um, English disease, um, and all of these things, all of these impacts, uh, all of the impacts of the things that I just described are still felt today. Yeah. So many of our communities are still stuck in this vicious cycle yeah. of, of socioeconomic disadvantage. Intergenerational trauma. Intergenerational trauma because of the things that happened during the colonisation process. You know, all, all we need to do is take a, a cursory look at the frontier wars to understand how brutal yeah. colonisation was for, for our people and our communities. Um, so with that said, that situation that I've just described is worlds away from the story that's told on January 26 every year yeah. and it's it's I'm sure that it's worlds away from, from um, the conversation that's had at many dinner tables and, and, and across many families in, in, the, in the country. Um, I don't understand how we as a country um, can move together, um, to move forward together um, if we don't have a shared understanding of where yeah. we've been. Um, Acknowledging the, the past and the truth. Absolutely. Mm. The, it, it happened, it's facts. Um, and I'm all for um, celebrating um, all of the good things that Australia is and all of the good things that Australia represents. Um, but I am also all for um, us making sure that we have a shared understanding of what that Australia was and what that Australia came from. And no for. denying. And, yeah. uh, absolutely. The, the denial mm -hmm. and the, um, the, the blatant lies that are told um, are, uh, are shocking to say the least. Uh, and it's incredibly disheartening for our people and our communities. Yeah. It's pretty evident too in the education systems oh, as well. Absolutely. Lack of Aboriginal perspectives in our classrooms as well. Yeah. A absolutely. And all you'd have to do is, is have a glimpse at the, the over-representation statistics that our young people face yeah. here in New South Wales. Yeah. Um, youth attention. Youth attention. 100% of the youth justice um, population of First Nations. And here in New South Wales, um, uh, up close to 50% of the out-of-home care um, the kids in our home care are Aboriginal and we see the same statistic in the youth justice sector. Yeah. Um, so, pretty profound. Yeah, we've got lots to do and, and this is a starting place. A absolutely. Yeah, and no, definitely. I, I, might, um, I might give a, a pretty pointy example about um, truth telling and, and I, I might for a second um, talk in actual fact um, so it's irrefutable and the audience can understand um, uh, the profound nature of, of what I'm talking about. So. Um, when, the, when the English arrived uh, some 200 years ago, um, they settled or colonised Australia under the, the legal fiction of terra nullius. And terra nullius is the notion that uh, there was nobody here, so the land, the land was free to, to, to settle on. Uh, we know that in 92, in the Mabo decision, terra nullius was overturned 
and Terry Nullis officially became legal fiction. So if we take a retrospective look at the colonisation process based on the understanding that Terry Nullis is a lie, well, we have to come to terms with the fact that there was essentially an attempt to wipe out a civilization of people that were here pre-colonial history. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. That's very yeah, important. A lot of Australians, you know, they want to be allies, that, you know, they're looking to support First Nations people, um, but they're not quite sure. Um, how can Australians get involved in the rule of statement from the heart? How can they, you know, uplift and empower you know, First Nations voices? Yeah, great question. And as I've mentioned a couple of times, the statement is absolutely a, a movement of the Australian people. The, the Uluru Statement itself um, was never gifted to the Australian Government, was never gifted to Parliament. Um, it is a, a living, breathing document that, is, uh, that, that was a gift to the, the people. And essentially, um, uh, everybody knows to get a referendum up, you need the majority of people in yeah. the majority of states to vote in favour. Um, so as we, uh, as we campaign tireless, tirelessly and we, we move aggressively towards a, a referendum, um, the, the best things that people can do at the moment is you know, have the tough conversations with your family and friends, um, have the conversations in your workplace, um, let people know that this is happening, um, yeah. the profound significance of, of what it means and what it could mean for Australia. Um, and there are some other things that you can do, such as uh, following social media, uh, yeah. following social media accounts. Raise awareness. Yeah, raising awareness where there's you can. There's a website? There is, yeah, it's uh, ulurustatement.net uh, and there's yeah. an Instagram account uh, at ulurustatement. There's so. a really good video um, on the website as well, um, which teachers can also share yeah. and in their classroom. Absolutely, so there's dedicated resources uh, all through the, the website, uh, which are uh, hold a, a body of information, which is really, yeah. really helpful. You know, definitely, because at the end of the day, if you call yourself a proud Australian, we've got this beautiful culture. Absolutely. You know, that Australians, you know, should be embracing. Absolutely. Um, yeah. One of the things that I um, that I love about the statement is um, one of the things that the statement represents to me is Australia finally taking the next step into um, into achieving a, a fuller expression of, of Australia's nationhood. So at the moment, um, Australia's relationship with its First Nations communities is one of uh, deficit. Um, we have a, um, a, a tendency to, to have a negative view of, of, of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and communities and, and the narrative is, is definitely one of deficit. And what the statement represents is redefining all of that and actually us giving, us giving Australia the opportunity to understand all of the really great things that is that makes up First Nations Australia. Um, we come from the oldest and richest culture in the world. Yeah. Um, we've got 60,000 years on the Egyptians, on, yeah. the, on the Great Pyramids. Um, so I think um, we've learned a thing or two in that time and um, it would be fantastic for us to be able to share that with Australia. Yeah, and for Australians to embrace our beautiful culture. Absolutely. You know, definitely. Um, look, thank you so much, Dylan, for joining me today and having a yarn about such an important social movement. Um, definitely um, encourage everyone to get involved. Like Dylan said, you know, pop on the website, raise awareness, start those important discussions. Absolutely, thank you so much for having me. Thank you.